Jack London, In a Far Country, Stories A Day's Lodging It was the gosh dangdest stampede I ever seen. A thousand dog teams hitting the ice. You couldn't see em for smoke. Two white men and a Swede froze to death that night, and there was a dozen busted their lungs. But didn't I see with my own eyes the bottom of the water hole? It was yellow with gold, like a mustard plaster. That's why I staked the Yukon for a mining claim. That's what made the stampede. And then there was nothing to it. That's what I said, nothing to it. And I ain't got over guessing yet. Narrative of Shorty John Messner clung with mittened hand to the bucking G-pole and held the sled in the trail. With the other mittened hand, he rubbed his cheeks and nose. He rubbed his cheeks and nose every little while. In point of fact, he rarely ceased from rubbing them, and sometimes, as their numbness increased, he rubbed fiercely. His forehead was covered by the visor of his fur cap, the flaps of which went over his ears. The rest of his face was protected by a thick beard, golden brown under its coating of frost. Behind him churned a heavily loaded Yukon sled, and before him toiled a string of five dogs. The rope by which they dragged the sled rubbed against the side of Messner's leg. When the dogs swung on a bend in the trail, he stepped over the rope. There were many bends, and he was compelled to step over it often. Sometimes he tripped on the rope or stumbled, and at all times he was awkward, betraying a weariness so great that the sled now and again ran upon his heels. When he came to a straight piece of trail, where the sled could get along for a moment without guidance, he let go the G-pole and battered his right hand sharply upon the hard wood. He found it difficult to keep up the circulation in that hand. But while he pounded the one hand, he never ceased from rubbing his nose and cheeks with the other. It's too cold to travel anyway, he said. He spoke aloud, after the manner of men who are much by themselves. Only a fool would travel at such a temperature. If it isn't eighty below, it's because it's seventy-nine. He pulled out his watch, and after some fumbling, got it back into the breast pocket of his thick woolen jacket. Then he surveyed the heavens, and ran his eye along the white skyline to the south. Twelve o'clock, he mumbled. A clear sky, and no sun. He plodded on silently for ten minutes, and then, as though there had been no lapse in his speech, he added, and no ground covered, and it's too cold to travel. Suddenly he yelled, Whoa! at the dogs, and stopped. He seemed in a wild panic over his right hand, and proceeded to hammer it furiously against the G-pole. You poor devils, he addressed the dogs, which had dropped down heavily on the ice to rest. His was a broken, jerky utterance, caused by the violence with which he hammered his numb hand upon the wood. What have you done anyway that a two-legged other animal should come along, break you to harness, curb all your natural proclivities, and make slave beasts out of you? He rubbed his nose, not reflectively but savagely, in order to drive the blood into it, and urged the dogs to their work again. He travelled on the frozen surface of a great river. Behind him, it stretched away in a mighty curve of many miles, losing itself in a fantastic jumble of mountains, snow-covered and silent. Ahead of him, the river split into many channels to accommodate the freight of islands it carried on its breast. These islands were silent and white. No animals nor humming insects broke the silence. No birds flew in the chill air. There was no sound of man, no mark of the handiwork of man. The world slept, and it was like the sleep of death.